Throughout the 90s, I had a belief that education was absolutely paramount. We should only hire people who went to the best schools, um, and, uh, and we discriminated on this basis very aggressively in hiring at PayPal. And I used this, I used to, and I, I, I thought this was the, the most important thing um, in our society. And over the last four or five years, I've gradually come to uh, shift my views on it uh, for a number of different reasons. Uh, uh, the narrow technology context in Silicon Valley is that I saw so many very talented people who had not gone through college tracks and who had still done uh, extraordinarily well. In some ways, they were often more creative. They were not uh, laden down with these enormous college uh, debts that uh, were somehow uh, forcing people to take uh, better paying jobs that were um, more remunerative but more boring and track them into things that were not as, uh, not as uh, interesting or important uh, that were discouraging people from doing things in nonprofits, uh, nonprofit work or uh, on the more entrepreneurial side. And this has become a more and more acute issue over the years because unlike the time when I went to college, the cost has gone up tremendously. The amount of debts people leave college with, with have gone up tremendously. And so the choices are very different from the ones people had 25 years ago. A high school, uh, the college uh, costs in um, nominal dollars have gone up by more than a factor of 10 since 1980. Um, even after inflation, it's gone up by 300%, costs about four times as much. Inflation adjusted to go to college now as it did 30 years ago. It's gone up more than anything else in our society, more than health care, more than housing, more than any of a number of other things we think of as uh, having been subject to runaway cost inflation and escalation. Um, and, uh, and as I've looked outside of just the narrow Silicon Valley entrepreneurial context, I've come to believe that the problem is much broader, that it's not just the most talented people who are perhaps being misdirected and encouraged to go on a very narrow tracked career, but that this is a broader problem and that we are in fact experiencing something of a bubble in education, a bubble that is as pernicious as the bubbles we had in uh, technology in the 90s and housing in the 2000s. And like those two other bubbles, it is characterized by two things. Number one, runaway costs where people are paying more and more for something where the quality hasn't gone up. In the, in the 90s, it was tech stocks. In the 2000s, it was housing. Education, I'm not saying it's worse than it was 30 years ago, but I don't think it's gotten much better. And secondly, by an incredible psychosocial dynamic where you cannot question it. And in 99, in Silicon Valley, you couldn't question the NASDAQ valuations. And in 2005, um, you could not question people buying houses. It was strictly taboo and forbidden. Uh, and in the same way, uh, this is the one thing people still really believe in our society. And to question um, the value of education is like questioning uh, the existence of Santa Claus with uh, three-year-old uh, kids or something like that. Um, and while uh, we're not trying to scare the children here or anything like that, we do think that uh, we cannot afford to have a third bubble in this country. We had two already. They were catastrophically bad. They led to enormous misallocation of resources. And when we look at education more carefully, there are a lot of worrisome signs. Uh, student debts at this point total over a trillion dollars. Uh, and when you look at how well people are doing who come out of college, uh, they are still doing pretty well. They're still doing better than they used to. But the outperformance has been going down. It's been going down since about 2000. Um, uh, and uh, you know the law school context I'm quite familiar with. There are about 50,000 people a year who graduate from law school in the U.S. There only are 30,000 legal jobs available in the U.S. And I would argue we have maybe too many lawyers as is. But uh, we're producing way more for a society that probably already has too many. The median wage for lawyers is 62,000, which isn't that great considering that you've taken on another quarter million in law school debt typically. Uh, Pre-med. Uh, there are only about 9% of the people who study pre-med have slots available to them in medical school. The other 91% are wasting their time. And somebody should have told them that their freshman or sophomore year and not waited till their senior year or several years of uh, post-college to figure that sort of stuff out. If you, you know, broaden the ambit uh, more, more generally, there's something like 17 million people in the labor force who have college degrees and are basically doing unskilled work. Um, or uh, sort of the sort of find narrow and extreme statistics. There's something like 6,100 people in the U.S. who have uh, PhDs and are doing janitorial work. And so when we uh, when we uh, say that uh, you know education is important and paramount, uh, that is true. But it can also be a distortion and it can be a distraction from some of the very real problems we have as a society. We need to figure out how do we create more jobs? How do we create more good-paying jobs? We don't have enough of either. 
in our society. And uh, while education is linked to them, it's not this absolute thing. And, uh, and what we want to question is this notion that education is an absolute good or an absolute necessity. And in fact, when people say, as our opponents do, that it is an absolute good or an absolute necessity, you start ignoring all these problematic facts. You start uh, making a lot of catastrophic approximations that abound. Um, and, uh, and that's what we want to sort of push back a little bit. Let me say one thing that we're not arguing for. We're not saying that nobody should go to college. We're not saying that college is categorically a bad thing. We're not saying everybody should drop out. We're simply saying that too many people are going to college, just like too many people are buying housing and too many tech companies were going public in the late 90s. Uh, doesn't mean there should be no tech companies or no houses. Um, it doesn't mean we should shut down all the colleges, but we shouldn't. We need to make this a much more careful, deliberate choice. And what we are hoping to start with this discussion and debate today is a discussion that would encourage all of you to think more about your future. Do not think of education as something uh, that's an automatic ticket to the future. You need to think about it yourself. If I had to do something over again, having gone to Stanford, I probably would still go to college, even with the higher costs. Um, I, I didn't have any great ideas of what to do instead. Uh, I'd probably still do the exact same thing as I did in the late 80s, even with all the problems. But one thing I would try to do very differently is not accept the answer that this was the automatic thing, that this was the thing you should do without thinking. I would have tried to think about what I want to do with my life as a senior in high school and a senior in college and not simply have more education be the automatic default answer for everything. The question we want to push the other side back on a little bit is, if education is an absolute good or absolute necessity, who is accountable if there's a mistake? And if these people are taking on these enormous debts and are getting it wrong, um, where can they go to get a refund? We, we do grow up with the notion, I think you've acknowledged it, that in fact you felt straitjacketed by it, that you do go to college because you're supposed to go to college. And yet the other side is arguing that that's part of the dream, part of the American dream. So take that on because it's, I think that they're onto something with that. Well, it's, uh, it's, it certainly was not historically part of the American dream. So if you looked at how many people uh, went to college in the U.S. in the 19th or early 20th century, it was a very, very small percentage. And it was, uh, this is a very recent phenomenon that this is seen as an absolute necessity. Um, and I think, uh, I think in, in many ways, I would actually flip it around and I would say, what's gone wrong with the American dream um, that we have to have people go to college uh, when that was never a necessity in the past. People don't need college degrees for m many of the jobs that uh, we have. There are many good jobs where you don't need them. There are many bad jobs people get stuck with with college degrees. Um, but uh, but so I'd, I'd actually flip it around. And you know, this whole question, what sort of a good is college? Is it an investment in your future? I don't think it's a good investment because it's costing too much and there was no, seemingly no accountability whatsoever from the other side on the costs. It was absolute good, any price pay no attention to what the price is. Um, is it a consumption decision? And I sort of have joked that it's like a four-year party, and I think that's kind of true, but I think people are too stressed out to really have a four-year party when they're taking on a quarter million in debt and know they're going to be debt slaves for the rest of their lives or for the next 10, 20 years. And so I think the way to think of it is that it's basically become an insurance policy because the cracks in our society have become so big, um, and we need to be asking why are so many people having to pay more and more for insurance, and what's gone wrong that we're paying so much for insurance? The rest of the world has caught the American dream. It's those Chinese students I talk about, they are just like our, my students here at Duke and at uh, Berkeley are. They're just like the students we meet over here. They've, they read the books, they follow us, they understand what we're doing, they want to get those bachelor's degrees, they want to get master's, and they want to get PhDs. That's how it is. So forget about our vision of the American dream. We're now a small part of the world. Our economy is becoming a decreasing part of the world. We're going to be competing uh, like you won't believe over the next 10, okay. 20, 30 years. Let's let the other side respond to that. I, 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 I didn't me, hear an answer look, to the question. Peter Thiel. Well, let me, uh, let me just tackle this whole globalization international thing. So I think there obviously are a lot of things that are very admirable about India, uh, China. People have a great work ethic. They're uh, thinking very much about the future. And I do not want to at all underestimate uh, how serious the competition is or encourage people to be complacent. But the proposition we're debating today is do too many kids go to, are too many kids going to college? And if you look at those countries, the percentage is much smaller. And it is, you know, the, the number, I looked these numbers up because I figured, I thought you might make this argument. And uh, the U.S., there are about 40 percent of college-age students are in college. And of course, there are a lot of them who end up dropping out, so it starts with more than 40, but on average, 40 percent are in college. In China, the number is 20 percent. In India, the number is 10 percent. And if you want to look at 
China and India. It is a brutally selective system. Very few people can get in. Um, people are worked incredibly hard once they're in college. Um, and if we want to be more like them, uh, the first thing, simplest approximation is you'd have far fewer people go to college. And this is true of any other country in the world you'd look at. And so if the U.S. should take its bearings from other countries, that is a very powerful argument for Peter, our side. Uh, we want to say on the one hand that college is an end in itself, it's an absolute good, we don't ask any questions about it, you can't, it's non-instrumental, and on the other hand, it is completely instrumental and it's what leads you to getting a better job, a more high paying job. You cannot have it both ways. But the one point that the other side did make is that, is that education can be transformative and somebody who may not necessarily start out as a freshman seeming like a superstar signed up for a, a BA of the, even of the nature that you may not feel, find terribly useful, that the experience of going to college can, can cause a blossoming and that just by being there, being in the situation, somebody who wasn't very promising might turn out to have a lot of promise. What a, can you take that on? Well, you, okay, Peter Thiel, you, you were ready with it. Go well, ahead. you know, we can, we can find all sorts of anecdotal things. We, we were told by the other side that we shouldn't look at anecdotes like Zuckerberg or, or Gates or Jobs, and, um, and I agree those are exceptional cases and there obviously are all sorts of people who have uh, idiosyncratic things that can happen in college, they can also happen outside of college. Socialization does not have to happen in college. People uh, should learn, how, you know, this is again a really bizarre recent phenomenon. Uh, you know, 92% of the people did not go to college in 1960. Uh, they were able to be citizens, they were able to vote, they were able to be, uh, you know, we wouldn't say that nobody should have voted in 1960 because they didn't have college degrees. That would have been an invidious thing to say. And when you say that college is a bubble, are you also arguing that, that, that colleges have a self-interest in growing? That in other words, they're, they're signing up students to keep the tuition up? Oh, I think there are extraordinary uh, conflicts of interest. Uh, it's, it's like subprime mortgage brokers saying people should buy houses. I mean, the, the, uh, the self-dealing that is going on is, uh, is, incredibly, uh, is incredibly severe in, in all of this. Uh, and I do think... Right. I, 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 I want to take that point directly. One, other, one, all right, other, one last point. Mm -hmm. the, uh, I, I, wanna, I, I do think you can't separate the question entirely from the cost question. And so it's like saying, it's like saying, you know, Mrs. Lincoln, besides that, how'd you like the play? So besides the fact that college costs you an arm and a leg, how, did you, how much do you like it? And um, that these two things are linked together. There is no one size fits all approach. There are um, uh, certain skilled people, very talented people. Um, not every talented person should go to Harvard, um, you know, there are a lot of uh, different kinds of things different people should do, and I think that's, that's, uh, that's sort of a basic starting point. We don't believe there is a single straitjacket, and the crazy thing in our society is that the more talented you are, the narrower the straitjacket has become. This is a very, very bizarre feature of it. We also agree that uh, learning is generally a very good thing, um, and we agree that uh, we should be, and I think we all four of us agree on that, but where there's a bit of a disagreement that I don't want to understate is that uh, a great deal of what masquerades as learning is nothing more than credentialing. Uh, and the basic numbers I've seen is that uh, it's something like 90% credentialing, 10% learning, if you try to sort of break the numbers out. So if you got into Harvard versus finishing high school, you make, let's say you make 30,000 a year in, out of high school, 60,000 a year out of Harvard, let's say it's two to one, so something in that ballpark, you'd get to 45,000 if you were good enough to get into Harvard, that's just selection, and you get to 57,000 if people knew you got into Harvard, that's the signaling. So 90% is credentialing, and the learning gets you from 57 to 60. We're in favor of that 10%, but uh, it, is, it is outrageous how it's been conflated with this credential which is being parasitically uh, charged to people uh, in this uh, way where the costs have escalated. If we have um, fewer people who go to college, the premium of wages will go up in China and India and Brazil and Turkey where the jobs will go and those folks will benefit. You know, I'm reminded of The Onion, um, which had a, uh, had a su suggested solution for the recession um, in the U.S. was just to give everybody another degree. And, um, and, you know, I think we have to think, you know, we, we can't just mechanically say you go to college, you get a B.A. It is what are you learning, what are the specifics, the, the most concrete, <laughs> skill-oriented education people get is engineering degrees. And that is actually probably the one area, and I, we may even agree on this, where I think uh, the U.S. Um, does not have an excess of engineers. And, but that is something that's specific and tracked, and engineering is specific. And that's what people get paid for the most. And as we're heading into a more technologically-oriented world, 
um, that's actually, there's going to probably be an increasing premium on engineering and on specific types of skills. And if I had to give people advice and they were set on going to college, you should study engineering or some form of engineering unless you are in a really unusual situation and really passionate about, uh, about something else. I want to quibble a little bit more with the uh, idea of the data shows and what this means. And we're always looking backwards. Um, and so in 2005, you could have said the data shows that housing prices always go up. And they are less likely to go up if they've gone up a lot. And, uh, and so what I would tell you as an analytic truth, not an empirical truth, when people are paying way more than they ever have, there are going to be more people who've been hurt than who were hurt in the 50s or 60s when it was effectively free. Um, and so, um, and this will not be seen in advance. You will see this in 10, 15, 20 years time. You're starting to see it with, uh, with uh, college students who have to move back in with their parents because they cannot afford to get their own place and pay off their debts. So is that the popping of the bubble that you referred to this college being? When you described it as a bubble and like housing and housing crashed obviously when credit dried up, what is the, cra what is the popping of the college bubble? It's, um, well, I, I think we are seeing it gradually unravel with, the, uh, with this incredible recession in the U.S. because the, uh, the, the basic lie that you pay, take on all this debt and then you get a good job um, is being seen as not quite true. And there are many cases where it's not true. Um, and I basically think it's sort of, uh, we, we see it unravel over four or five years as, uh, as you have one class after another graduate and there are no good jobs, even for the people with college degrees. I, I would say it's different from housing because there's no specific market. You can't precisely evaluate mm -hmm. a college degree. And that's actually one of the things that makes it a much more pernicious bubble than housing because um, it will not pop instantly and therefore it's likely to be actually even more pronounced and more extreme okay. before it unravels. Question. The one thing that was uh, clearly not done by the other side was to answer my question about where would the accountability be for all the people who get hurt by, uh, by the system that costs too much and is not delivering. And uh, it is clear to me that there is no accountability on the part of our education establishment. They're not willing to give people refunds. They're not, uh, you know, it's, it's if you get a Ford and it blows up, a Ford Pinto blows up, you can go to the Ford company, you can get money back for your car, you might even be able to sue them for torts. Um, such a mentality is unthinkable in the college case. And given that there is this lack of accountability, um, buyer beware. Um, you are on your own. You take on the loans. It's worse than housing debt. You can never get out of it, not even through bankruptcy. Bush amended the bankruptcy laws in 2005, so you cannot get out of college debts for the rest of your life. And you need to think about this on your own. The way bubbles end is when people start thinking for themselves. Uh, and that is the first thing we want to encourage people to do is not to simply go with the social pressure, not to go with the bill of goods. This has always been done. This is automatic. This is necessary. This is globalization. But think for yourself, is the cost worth the benefit? Uh, and and uh, when more people think for themselves about this, uh, we will get to a very different equilibrium where there's less of a caste system, less of a a social need to do these things for status reasons. People will still go to college. They will uh, still get advanced degrees, but there will be fewer of them who do it because there are a lot of people who are doing it for the wrong reasons. And I think that will be a much, uh, much healthier and more balanced country.